Welcome back. We're good now. Okay. Awesome. Uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, to uh, the gathering. I hope that you're able to connect and pray together and just catch up with everyone uh, for the weeks. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to jump right into the message today. So I'm going to read scripture first, then pray, and then we'll go right on in. So uh, I encourage you to, you can pull up either on your phones or in a physical Bible, Matthew 21, 1 to 11. Okay, so here we go. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Beth of, Beth of Edge, Age, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples to say, to say, oh, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion to look to... Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of, of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowd were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Okay, let's pray. Uh, thank you, God, uh, for your word uh, and just your spirit uh, being with us in our weekly um, lives, God. I pray uh, as I speak that you make my words uh, uh, knowledgeable and uh, you uh, perfect the imperfect, God. I just pray that uh, you speak to us in this time together and uh, you bless our conversations and, uh, and community. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, Matthew, this, this passage uh, is traditionally read uh, during, well, tomorrow, which is uh, Palm Sunday, which if we were more liturgical, there's like, like it goes into Holy Week and there's a ton of celebrations and, and it, it links to like Ash Wednesday that happened like 40 days ago where people get like ashes on their head from like the previous like year's palms and all that fun, all that fun uh, information. Uh, but we're not as liturgical, uh, and that's okay. Uh, so I'm not going to get into, like, the whole Holy Week stuff and whatnot. You, you can Google that. You can Wikipedia it. You can ask Greg more about it um, uh, and uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, but I just, like, really want to go through just the text with you uh, and just, like, really uncover what Matthew's getting at here. Uh, because Matthew, Matthew's uh, writing is very interesting. It's a lot like the Old Testament um, and because Matthew's writing to Jewish people. So he's doing a bunch of, like, really interesting things in the text, and uh, it actually speaks to what's going on here uh, and is really powerful. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, so, li like the Old Testament writers, Matthew is asking you, the reader to, of the text, to, and, and really all the Gospels are asking you to read carefully and meditate on every piece of writing. Uh, the first section of this text, Jesus is telling the disciples to get a donkey and a colt, and, and Jesus gives instructions on what they are to do. Uh, so, and that, like, when they tell this person that this person will listen to them and be like, aha, I know that person, I will do what you say. Um, and, and that in itself uh, draws some parallels to, like, Jesus has some sort of power that, that is known to people. Um, and, and that's just not a prophet, but is, like, kind of pointing back to, like, the kings in the Old Testament. And, and, and to really, like, point, like, to really be pointed about it, Matthew writes that this is done to fulfill the prophet 
has spoken. And, and if you're like, I, I don't see any quote there, like who's Matthew like pointing to? Well, it's actually Zechariah uh, chapter uh, nine. Uh, and it, it's verse five, actually. Um, and it's a big section, actually, from, it says from the oracle <laughs> in the writing there, that like details a coming kingdom with, um, like the liberation of Israel and like uh, slaves being set free. And it's a really beautiful um, chapter, verse. It's a really beautiful book, actually. And, and uh, by referencing Zechariah, Matthew is pointing the reader to Jesus being the true king of Israel. Uh, if you read all, all of Zechariah 9, uh, you would see how how God will also judge Israel's armies uh, and the, ar- the or sorry, will judge Israel's enemies and probably Israel itself and bring the kingdom of God to the oppressed to liberate them. Uh, if we move farther into the text, the next hyperlink, as I like to call it, like hyperlinks, you know how you like, you click on like the Wikipedia page and it takes you to the next one and then you like, oh, there's something else interesting, and you click and it goes to the next one. That's kind of what's going on here. So the next hyperlink builds on this, in, uh, this image from Zechariah. And Matthew writes that the people place their cloaks on the street uh, on, in Matthew 21, 8. And, and this references back to a story arc that occurs in 2 Kings, uh, like chapter 9 area. It's where Elisha anoints, uh, or sorry, a follower of Elisha anoints King Jehu, um, who goes forward to give judgment upon uh, the house of Ahab. And if you don't, if you're like, hey, Keegan, my, my whole uh, ancient Israel uh, history is kind of rusty. Basically, what you need to know that Ahab is bad, and he has put up shrines to Baal, and basically stole, like, stolen the king's seat. Well, in a sense, like, there's a whole, like, prelude to that. It's a very interesting book. Um, but basically, Jehu is kind of like this this savior I- I- in the book, that Jehu's the good king, and he comes into the city in Kings 9.13, and individuals lay down their cloaks as he walks in to support, uh, in support the coup in which King Jehu starts, and against the, the house of Ahab, King Azari, and Queen Jezebel. And he basically goes on, to uh, kill a bunch of Baal worshiping prophets, he goes and like, uh, basically, like, like it's it's a coup in in the whole entire sense of it, a- and basically liberates um, the people. Um, but uh, as you kind of guessed, King Jehu doesn't like turn out to be the greatest either, because he lets these things called Ashir pools, and they're like the female version of Baal, still stand in golden calves to be still erect, uh, um, arrest, uh, like happening all over the place. So basically the image is like, he's pointing back to the judgment Jehu did in the Old Testament. That's, that's what you should know. Again, uh, Matthew is using the story to speak to the type of person Jesus is. Jesus is the king that will come to cleanse his temple from the adultery that his people have committed. So, and then Matthew uh, 21, 8 also references palm branches. And the palm branches is, branches are reference to 2 Maccabees. Now, you might be, um, Keegan, I don't know what 2 Maccabees is. Like, what, what is this image? Like, I, I'm above my head. Um, all you need to know is that maybe some of your Bibles have it. Um, it would be, like, in the Catholic Bible or the Eastern Orthodox Bible, those are like a couple, but basically 2 Maccabees tells the history of the Maccabean Revolt, and this is kind of like the intertestinal, like, period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, stay with me. You're like, Keegan, this is a lot. Like, I'm almost done, and then we're back to not talking about ancient uh, Jewish history, um, but it's found in your Apocrypha or the intertestinal portion of your Bible, and one through four are historical books of the Maccabean revolution that kind of gives you a background to the context that Jesus is coming into. And it details the Jewish point of view, the Maccabean revolt. Um, and like, like I said, if you have any questions about that, yeah, do some research about it. I don't have time to 
do a whole class on it. <laughs> anyway, this is what's happening in, in 2 Maccabees. A and this is that Judas Maccabeus and his rebels have taken, the, taken on the process of cleansing the temple from the Greek pagan practices. So at that time, there would have been like, um, in, in the temple would have been like, uh, kind of like similar to what was happening like during the, like when Baal was in the Old Testament, there's like, Greek gods, like altars to Greek gods and stuff and goddesses. And, and they came and they cleaned it out. So in celebration against cleaning out and cleansing the temple, uh, they cut the palm branches and they sung hymns to, to um, it, it kind of seems to God in it, um, but it, it also seems to Judas Maccabeus, and, and they basically worship him for liberation of the temple. Uh, now Matthew again is stating the liberation of Israel's people from oppression of the oppressor and cleansing of the temple. The thing is, is he's the true Messiah, not a pseudo-Messiah-like figure that Judas Maccabeus was. Um, and also, if you're like, like, why should I even know about this person? It, it, it's the, the Maccabees actually marry into the house of Herod, and, and that's why Herod is kind of like one of the big baddies, if you will, <laughs> in the New Testament, and why Jesus goes up against them, because Herod did have, like, clout with how the synagogues and, and how the Jewish people saw him. And so, like, he is a, a, a you could say he's a Messiah-like figure. Matthew finishes this hyperlinking section by declaring that Jesus is the true king, the Messiah, the liberator, and, and like uh, the priest king, uh, with the crowd declaring Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. In the biblical narrative, it's stated repeatedly that the Messiah, the true king of Israel, um, the, the kingly priest, would come through the line of David. And the proclam proclamation is the recognition of Jesus as that true king of Israel. And while the king, of, uh, while King Jehu and Judas like ultimately failed in, in what they did and how they were received, uh, Jesus would succeed. Um, so uh, during this time, uh, we're going to pause on all those thoughts and uh, we're going to uh, have our questions. So our questions. Uh, why do you think Matthew uh, is referencing these portions of scripture? Um, and when Jesus is coming into the city, uh, Matthew uh, wants you to draw certain parallels um, as you read this, um, and it might be more difficult for us today because we're not Jewish, to be quite frank. Uh, I mean, you might be Jewish, but you might not have the knowledge of uh, that the Jews would at that time, but what do you think was going through the heads of the people welcoming Jesus into the city? Would they have, like, noticed these things? And what is the role of king in the biblical text? Uh, so we'll give you 10 minutes, and then we'll bring you back, and we'll continue on with the message. Awesome. Okay, welcome back. I, I hope uh, that you're able to have a, a good discussion there. I know, like, it was really heavy, um, just with like the background and whatnot, but uh, it, it's really important to this story because if, we, if we're just looking at the story in general, Jesus comes in on a donkey, Matthew references some things and life goes on. And, and Matthew's writing to a predominantly Jewish audience, so it's really different, it's really difficult for us to really get into like the mindset of what Matthew's like doing here because Matthew is referencing back to these stories and he's not saying that... Um, Zechariah and Kings and Maccabees are directly pointing to Jesus. Um, there's a lot of people that like to look in the Old Testament for every nitty-gritty de detail about Jesus, and, and that's fine, but the Old Testament also on its own holds a lot of power um, with stories and teachings that aren't just brought up in the normal way, and so um, Ma Matthew's wanting us to think about like what's going on here, and in and uh, he wants us to think about kingship and, and how that works with the, uh, out for his audience in relation to Jesus. And he drives this point home with the next part in the story where Jesus goes on, on and cleanses the temple. Uh, if we were ancient, uh, like Israelites, or, 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 were part, or, or if we were Jewish people at this time, this would have like really like 
like blown our heads off. It, it would have really been like a big statement. It, it's gutsy, um, but we're not. And so um, it's somewhat tricky to really like get to the core of like what um, what Matthew is doing, but I'm, I'm going to try for you tonight, okay? So if you're from ancient Israel, you would have understood the role of king was a mediator of the covenant and God's people. Uh, and the kings were to rule over the people of Israel with righteousness and justice, and um, they rarely did. But the kings did this at points, uh, and, and it failed miserably <laughs> to uphold the law and the covenant or, or to rule with even righteousness and justice. And, and uh, they usually instead uh, did what was best in their own eyes uh, and worshipped other gods uh, instead of what they uh, should have been doing. And in the big biblical narrative, it, it stated repeatedly um, that this is the one thing that, that's always pointing towards Jesus, that the Messiah, the true king of Israel, will come through the line of David. And the proclamation is the recognition of Jesus as the true king of Israel, or the king priest of Israel. Um, at first, Jesus, you could say, succeeds in the eyes of the Jewish people, but he ultimately fails in their eyes as we enter Holy Week. Um, while Jesus is pointing, or sorry, while Matthew is pointing towards Jesus as king, but is, is using references that the people would know, and he is also is making a statement that he's a different type of king. He, he's the true king. Uh, he's not the king that puts people in slavery to build stuff. Um, this is the liberator uh, that the Old Testament talks about. And Jesus is not going to be uh, like any king that uh, came before him. No, he, he's going to be a priestly king. Um, and see, the people of Israel would, uh, would think the Messiah would be a militant power. You know how we're talking about uh, Judas Maccabeus there and, and how um, they, they were in exile. So they were being oppressed by the, by the Greek people and then they rose up, and they fought against them, and killed them, uh, and that's kind of like what they would have thought uh, Jesus would be, that kind of Jesus would wipe the Roman Empire from the city of Jerusalem, and, and from Israel, but Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he goes on to deliver some of the most intense rebukes, not against the Romans, but the scribes and the Pharisees, and foretells the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem, with the imagery noting that uh, this is the ending of that age. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, we don't have physical kings, uh, uh, most of us anyway. Uh, I don't know if you came from somewhere that has a physical king. Probably not. Like I mentioned before, it's hard for us to think of a, even a metaphor to replace kingship. Uh, but let me try and make some connections. In, in the Western world, uh, I would say kings today would be like the books that we read or, or the philosophies that we hope in, the way we think the world should go. Our kings can be justice or even ourselves uh, and our desires. It can be also uh, more uh, like being a moral person. It can be the belief that humanity needs to progress. It can even be the primary theology which we believe it is the ideas that we even can hold about Jesus and not Jesus himself. Here's something. Politics and what we define as the self, which is yourself and how you think, are our kings. We believe that we can bring the garden city of God without the king. And we think that with science, our desires, and politics, that we can bring justice and righteousness. Those things cannot bring in themselves recreation. We must believe in justice because Jesus is king, and we must believe that righteousness and holiness, not just because the culture tells us character matters and that ethics matter and morality matters, but because Jesus is king. And if we believe change is possible, not by chance, but because Jesus is king, and that is not what Jesus hopes for, but is Jesus' promise. The Jewish people were kind of the same way as uh, putting different things um, before as, as their king instead of Jesus. See, I can't make too many connections in this story. Like, like some people really like making this connection um, that like so the people that were in the crowd welcoming Jesus in were probably like also shouting crucify him a week later. But, but I'm sure some of them did. And, and 
even one of his followers thought that it would be a good idea to silence him. And, and with that said, I don't think Judas had the cross in mind when he did what he did. Even the people that did not see him come into the city, those people didn't think that he was king because of the preconceived idea of what they thought a king would be. And while we might be 2,000 years from those people, we are all not that different. We still have ways of thinking about how Jesus, Yahweh, or the Holy Spirit work in our lives and the people's lives around us. And, and those are, things are good. They, they hold structure to our beliefs. Yet Jesus did not come to be a traditional king or like any king that Israel or the world had seen or even that we see today. The Gospels make sure to make this very, well, I, I would say very obvious, but it not, might not be obvious. Jesus rides in on a donkey. And, and that, I don't know about you, but I don't see any king riding in on a donkey usually in stories. Usually it's like a white, like, horse, right? It's flowing mane. Maybe it's like jet black horse. Well, not jet, but like, you know what I mean. Like a black, shiny horse with a flowing mane. Uh, but, like, that's like my idea. Um... But Jesus isn't like other kings. No, he walks in with a ragtag of misfits, his disciples, which had everything from uh, a fairly, like, militant Jewish terrorist to, like, just some random kids in it. Uh, and he ends up being crucified on a cross, and his disciples are in ruins, and they doubt instead. And Jesus really does not meet the expecta expectations of the people. Instead, he kind of, like, if we just stopped at the cross, it'd be like, oh, there's another prophet that kind of died. Yet, in the cross, in the brokenness and the doubt of Jesus' disciples, and in Jesus' nonviolent ethic of revolution, or, sorry, restoration, God breaks through. And we must look for God breaking through in ways that surprise us, offend us, and go against the way we think how God should break through. Here's another thing. While Matthew's not the writer of Revelation, similar imagery is used in the Revelation of John, which we just were kind of talking about uh, a couple months ago. In the Revelation of John, Jesus comes once again as king. He, he comes as liberator for all. He judges the wicked, and uh, he will bring complete justice and righteousness. And while I look forward to that moment, I also cannot help and think, do I think the statement that Jesus is king is a good idea? Uh, let me explain. Uh, here's some things. I live in the West. I'm a Christian. Uh, the West is like the empire to the rest of the world, and uh, Christianity has done a lot of bad things in God's name. And, uh, um, and just like all of us on this call and in this building, I haven't been righteousness all the time, and, and I don't think you've been righteousness all the time either. Uh, if you have, call me up. I'd love to know. But Christianity has built walls to say what Jesus as king looks like and has left out many. And the church has not invited the poor to the table, believe that, and they have believed that violence is a kingdom ethic when it is not, and has said that the material creation is not important when it very well is to a number of different issues. That's a different sermon. And has taught other aspects of the Bible as gospel instead of the cross and re resurrection. And we have let the culture of this world at this time and times before form what King Jesus looks like. Now, as I come to a close on, on this sermon, I am not having a nice little bow in conclusion <laughs> here uh, because uh, it's Holy Week. And I would like you to uh, kind of think about this as the week goes on, uh, and maybe do some digging as yourself. Uh, and um, you might be uncomfortable, you might be mad, uh, maybe I offended you. Uh, if if that's happened, that's a fir like that's that doesn't happen much at Converge, but yeah. Here here's it, it, um, the proclamation is subversive to everyone who hears, uh, no matter who you are. And, and me writing this even, I was like, I, I, I like was thinking about how do I perceive Jesus as king, and is that actually Jesus as king? Uh, we all hold on ideas of Jesus that are not true, and we must remind ourselves of what Jesus as king really means. Um, from where I stand, 
uh, I think we need to ask if we like the, like the declaration of Jesus as king, and what do we expect from Jesus as king? And is the statement a very good thing to us, uh, or have we become like the crowd, where we like the idea, we like what the prophets said to us, or, or what the Bible has said to us, but we, we don't like the reality of that statement, potentially. So the question stands, is Jesus king to us, to you, and to me? Let's pray. Uh, thank you, God, uh, that even in our limited understanding and our ever pressing forward into learning about you and how you work in this world, uh, that you are graceful and you show us uh, who you are in many ways. And uh, why I come to a conclusion here asking us to meditate on what Jesus as King looks like, uh, I pray that uh, you bring us closer into seeing what that is uh, clearer. And uh, why we might all see Jesus as King in, in different areas of our life, uh, that we can still see your miraculous, um, powerful act with your son as Jesus on the cross. Uh, and how that truly uh, has changed our lives, the world, um, and, and just creation in general. So God, I pray that you help us uh, see forward and your, our guiding light uh, as we think about this question and as we go into Holy Week and also uh, the rest of, uh, this, of Good Friday and the Resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Sorry, uh, just before I end, uh, I've done this thing where I have, like, resources uh, at the end of my sermons uh, because um, sometimes I'm not, like, I just, yeah, I, I just read a lot, and these are some of the ideas that are on my mind uh, and that, um, like, from what I, like, the work that I do with, like, the scripture and then, and then um, taking what other people think about that, those ideas, uh, and bringing them into. So, um if you're like Keegan, some of the ideas you said are really weird and I've never heard them before. Well, here's some of where the ideas came from. Uh, so we got uh, N.T. Wright, The Day of the Revolution Began. Uh, that's a very, uh, it's not super academic, but um, yeah. Uh, or uh, the other more popular option is uh, The Day Jesus, or The Day God Became King. Uh, Bible Project is a great resource um, and that I just like using a lot. Uh, check it out. Uh, the Skeletons in Glo God's Closet, if you have a bunch of questions um, about how does, the rev how does the cross, how is the cross actually a good thing with all the violence that's in the Bible, highly recommend that one. And then God Has a Name, uh, which is also a, a really great read, uh, both thinking as Jesus is king and God is king. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to pass it off to Greg uh, to close up. Thank you, Keegan, and uh, just really appreciate what you, you had to say and how far you had to, to dig into a lot of this stuff. It's uh, a lot of hours of, of work and preparation, but I love that, that idea like of Jesus being king, and, and what does that really mean, and what, how does that affect our lives? Because so often we're tempted to just take Jesus, and it's like, I'm going to live my life, and I'm going to, you know, sandwich Jesus in and get him to work for me. Um, but really, if we want to be true followers of Jesus, we need to recognize who he is and what his mission is and then find out what he's doing in our lives, in our hearts, and in our society and plug in and be part of that and, and follow him. And so it's a great challenge this week with it being Holy Week, the, the week of, of Easter here. And so hope you can join us on uh Good Friday at um, 10.30 on, on YouTube. We'll be sending the link out. And then next Saturday, we'll be back here uh, at uh, 6 o'clock for our Easter gathering. And so we'd we'll love for you to be able to join us that as well.